All right, so we're having another discussion of the Desiderata Extinctionati, and today is August 8th, 2021. And since it's an open discussion, I'll start off with, um, we have an upcoming meeting with Jordi Aitken on Tuesday. Um, just since it's our first meeting with him, uh, should we make it public and recorded? Um, Jordi didn't make any preference, so I'm sure He's okay if it gets recorded. I, th I think we should record it and then just see how it goes down, whether we actually publish it. But I mean, it would be nice just to have it for posterity because it might be okay. an important yeah. discussion. And um, should, we should make yeah. it public too, we'll right? get too yeah. heavy into detail. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we might do heavy into details at this at this stage. I think we should just be a little bit circumspect about oh. some subjects. So either we might edit it out, or or otherwise, you know, um, okay. or just you know, it'd be nice to have it, and we could release it much later for right. historical purposes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, okay. And yeah, that's pretty much it with Jordi. Uh, he's. He's busy, he, he's going off grid, so it'll be hard to catch him. But we'll, you know, we'll do our best. Um, he has an hour with us and we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that'd be great, Other Did you see that bit on in Bright Accent? We we talked about to to Spencer, which is the I, I thought it was so funny, the guy getting on a yacht and going in search of the poles of geomagnetic reversal. Oh yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> straight out of my book almost. It's so close. But uh, yeah, that, I think that's that is is gonna become a bit of esoteric secret knowledge, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we can, we can tie that in. I mean, yeah, this art can go many places. And hopefully if we get collaboration from Jeff and the gang, it can just be a continuation of their project or I mean, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, that, that's what I would like to do is just keep everything they've done and just fold, fold everything together. And so it's, it's already such a body of work. It would, it's kind of impenetrable. It's really, <laughs> it's really fascinating. You know? Right. Yeah. Um, just recently I was watching um, that Meow Wolf origin story. And to actually open, I don't know if you know, but to open, they have a location in Santa Fe, one in Las Vegas and another, and um, they just opened up in Denver, but they did need some capital to like a lot of money. Um, George R.R. Martin helped fund there because he's from that area. He lives in New Mexico. Um, at the time he lived in New Mexico and he helped fund that, uh, location get it all set up so i'm just realizing yeah the seed money that's that's very important in, in any like art project an art or yeah yeah um i think i think those guys suffered a lot from covid because they had storefronts so they had those those stores and i think they had to close um, so uh, Jeff mentioned from the in interview of his, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I like doing, I like bootstrapping things on a shoestring and it's amazing what you can, you can actually do. But the, the way I see funding is, is that, yeah, you need a bit of seed capital, maybe a million or two, but the way it normally works is if you just get going, and you, you just get to a place where you absolutely cannot move until you have funding. And the funding normally just comes. If you if you have the right people involved and, the, and you've got momentum, um, the money just comes up. It doesn't really work. What most people do is they think, first, you've got to get the money. 
and then you you know you go down sand hill road and you try and get venture capital and you spend a tremendous amount of effort the normal way for entrepreneurs in silicon valley for example is then they spend about a year or more sometimes two just pounding the, the pavement trying to get venture capital and shake the tree and stuff um and then they just hawking an idea and a spreadsheet and stuff um and I always thought that was the wrong idea, and I've, I, I had much more success just starting. You just start, and then just, just get as far as you can and keep on going and building and stuff. And this, this, that's what I've done here is you just try and get as much as you can together on your own um, and just keep on building the thing. And then you know, at some stage, people get it, and then they want involvement in the thing. But it's it's very very hard to peddle just an abstract idea. So you know, I don't. People people see something, then then it's uh, they they want to get on board. But I kind of reminded of of like um, Monty Python and the the Holy Grail, um, and that's they they did that on a shoestring. They basically they didn't. They just carried on with the project. They carried on writing it, and they carried on. So just doing all the stuff they could and not getting funding to do it. And then eventually they had a script and they, I think it was George Harrison or somebody, he funded the whole freaking movie. And he said, like, he said, you know, I just want to see it made. He said, I just want to see the movie. That's what I'm going to put the money in. And so you get to a stage where, you know, maybe, maybe with with an arg like this you'd get somebody that just saying like i just want to see the arc. i just want to see see this happen um and so i always kind of feel like the money's secondary and it's uh, you know you it comes afterwards <laughs> yeah, that's a good yeah. point um meow wolf but, actually they it similar thing happened to them they they didn't go up to george R. R. martin immediately they actually did their own projects a lot of them collaborated together. It, it's an interesting story. They despised um, uh, mainstream art. They wanted to create their own art, and they just uh, just a group of kids, yeah, just collaborated and created their own projects together. Um, they just went from curator. They just sought out a curator who would just oh we we just need a space and we'll build. And they, they had a few things before they realized um, uh, they, there was a bowling alley that they wanted to create, the, uh, that Meow Wolf that, that you know of now that's in Santa Fe. And uh, luckily, one person knew of George R.R. R. Martin. And they, it took him some time to, they took, it took time to convince George R.R. R. R. Martin, but I'm sure they showed him, oh, this is the projects that we did. This is what we're thinking about. So they already had, um, I guess, proof that they could create the project. And uh, they had um, like an ambition. So that kind of um, brought it together for George R.R. R. Martin. But even then, there was a point in the movie where George, uh, he said, he said, um, yeah, they convinced me. I bought the bowling alley. But god help me so he even george had doubts that it can all always fall apart but he had that glimmer of hope you know i think that's how all of these i'm, I'm sh i bet even Mon monty python george george harrison might have thought oh this this could all go to you know this could all collapse but i'm just gonna give it a chance so yeah it's, it's interesting yeah i don't think a lot of I don't think a lot of people know, but venture capitalists, most venture capitalists and the, the, the guys that are most successful, they actually, um, they work from their gut. So, I, you know, you see all these things like in the UK, the Dragon's Den, and I think in the US it's called Shark Tank and stuff. And all of that is, is made up. It's, it's not really how venture capital works and how pitches go and stuff. Um, so for starters, you know, you don't have the venture capitalists competing against each other. So you don't have a, a row of five of them where you're actually doing a pitch and then you play each other, you know, you get the chance to play play them off against each other and stuff. And so, but uh, yeah, 
I think the average Joe doesn't realize that the uh, business guys they they work um, on a hunch, and so if you if you get started, um, you know, then they can see the magic. They can see often better than the people involved. Um, but yeah, it's um, we it, we're in a very interesting time because as as a passion project goes. There, there are a lot of people that think the same way, you know, that there needs to be change, there needs to be cultural change, that they see that, that you know, when, once you've bought the bunker, you know that the pitchforks are coming. You know, you think, what, what do you do next with, uh, with all the hundred million you've got over? And a lot of guys, I think, you know, are looking for people to say, you know, for, who have answers. There's so few people that have answers. You have the guys who are doing the great unplugged and the guys that are prepping and stuff, but um, nothing really sexy. And so I think uh, I think we've got something in the fact is, you know, we complete collapsitarians, but we we have a plan. <laughs> most most people in collapse are like, oh, I'm just going to slip my wrist now. I, mean, I think it's quite rare to, I haven't seen anybody that says, you know, collapse is coming in. Fuck, we're going to make it awesome. <laughs> This is going to be the best collapse anybody's ever seen. Yeah, that's uh, that kind of spirit. I think would uh, would catch fire. I think a lot of people would like that. So let's let's move forward cautiously and see how how, how we do. But things are coming together. Um, it, it's at this stage. I think there would have to be some major reversal. You know, basically, we'd have to be sideswiped by blindsided by something. So things are. You know, you can normally feel when when you're just about to get a critical mass, and I think we're very close. So, yeah, I think um, after the meeting the, that I have, um, I think we we can move into a stage where we, you know, start using uh, kind of celebrity power and and the kind of the money that comes with it. But I think it. I hope we can avoid going out to get money. I, what I think would work best is if you get artists and person, you know, particularly rich and famous artists of all flavors. Um, they and then they they have the pulling power. But I think it would be good to try and you know use the current people we've got and the celebrity power pulling power that they have and leverage that. And then you bring you know famous people in. And um, and then you know involved in the project, not not funding it, and then you know they those the there's a certain class of successful uh, creative that that can always bring money in. You know, there's there's a lot a lot of money just circulating. I mean, there's just tons and tons of it. It's just washing out there. Um, uh, but it's it's hard to make contact with, so it's best not to even try. You just push forward and then rely on the guys that have taps into it. That you just know the money comes you know, when the time is right. You got your act together. The money comes. You know, people people reward reward success. So yeah, that's that's always been my philosophy, and it's always paid off. But, um, I I think. We're getting close to where we've got a complementary team of all the the right people, and I've, I've got a very clear vision in, in my mind. <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's kind of a fatal flaw to to go ahead with with my vision. Is basically I can suggest my vision, but you you have to incorporate other people, especially like if if Jeff Hull, you know, got was interested. If those kind of guys, you've got to. You got to work with what they wanted to, and the, you know they might they might see it in a lot more egotistical way, um, but you know you just have to compromise and you know, just do do things. But it's it's far more interesting to think of it like a plant or something where you just or a tree and you just say you know fly my pretty. <laughs> it's it's much better to give birth to something that then takes on its own life. And to have a plan and say like, uh, this is this is my master plan and this is what must work. It's it's, it's far more interesting to just just start something and see what it turns into. It's kind of like 
you know, having having a child or something. You just the art of child rearing, according to me, is to to try and you know let them grow into whatever they're going to be, <laughs> not try and shape them too much. So yeah, you got to feed and water them and love them, but then you know you kind of they're kind of going to grow into what they're going to go grow into. Anyway, exciting times, I must say. <laughs> yeah. Has anybody got any insights or observations or questions about any of this? I was just thinking um, uh, what you said about the people coming along, you know, it's just like a, an extension of that, that saying about when the student is ready, the guru or the teacher will appear, you know. So there's kind of a parallel there. Um, I also think with um, uh, Jeff, I, I, you know, I think he's he does have a substantial sort of. I think he's got a significant personal agenda. It just, you know, when you look at the end of Broad Axiom, where he's, um, he, you know, part of what he was saying was was a little bit of a tantrum that it wasn't everybody wasn't going to play the game the way he wanted it. Um, yeah, I don't know how big of a part of it that is for him. Um, so, you know, I just you just sort of reminded me of that talking about, uh, you know, whether there's any ego invested and, and, you know, people like that wanting to do their own thing. So probably would have to make some allowance for that, I guess. See, he's he's yeah, because so he's he's been doing his own thing for a long time. Yeah, and and he's got money, so he can right. He he is times his own, so he he can do what he wants. Yeah, but um, I don't see it as ego. You see, as an artist, you get a kind of a big vision, and then you know you want to put that vision together, and it's it's not something that's like a Chinese menu that people can say, oh, well, we like this part of your vision, this bit sucks. And the other. No, no, it all fits together in, in an amazing and seamless thing. It's just you guys don't get it, you know, kind of thing. And so they, you know, it's kind of like a Da Vinci masterpiece. It's, it's like it's you can't um, pick and choose bits of it. <laughs> it basically, uh, the artist knows that it has to be this way because everything fits together in a Kantian whole kind of thing is each bit supports the other bit and it you can you know it's only the the genius artist that but knows how it fits together so then they can insist that the machine has to be built this way um, but it's not them trying to express themselves and say this is me and my passion project and have a tissy fit because um, it's not going my way it's it's having a tissue fit because people don't see that vision. They don't understand the machine. And so then they, they make, you know, basic assumptions that, that are wrong. See, most people, when they do a project, they they sketchy. They don't have a, an, a complete vision. So if you get a visionary, they have a complete vision, and it all fits together. Now, a lot of people can't understand that. I've had this problem all my life for in in business and stuff because and and for working for other people because you know if i tasked with something i say okay this is what you need to do and everybody goes like they think that you know you're working the same way they are so you think oh you know hugh's got some good ideas but ah, i don't like these ideas and stuff and you say no you might not like those ideas but you have to have them otherwise this doesn't work you say like well i can't quite see it and i say i know you can't see it but it would take take me two lifetimes to explain it to you. So you just got to take it on trust. And they say, oh, this is bullshit. Yeah, no, nobody understands everything. Nobody knows the future is what you hear. me. <laughs> and this is well, what they're talking about is themselves. It's like, you don't know the future. <laughs> when you assemble anything, it's, you know, it's like a meal. You can like, oh, you know, hold the hold the gherkins. I'm not so interested in the anchovies to hold those and stuff. And you say like, yeah, it's it's not McDonald's, dude. If you if you go and to to have a master chef, you don't you have to have the whole meal as the chef creates it. You can't say, 
yeah, well, well, yeah, but I don't like this. So it's like, well, well then you're not, you don't understand gourmet cooking. <laughs> Fuck off at the restaurant. And so, so that's where the ego is, is a lot of these entrepreneurs and CEOs and rich guys, they're all fucking just exploding egos. And, and they don't understand that so an artist can come with a complete vision. And they're not being pernickety about the, this part and that part and everything uh, because, you know, they're egotists and they're saying, I insist that that must be in there. They're saying like, no, it, it's like a chef with saying like, if you don't have this like slight almonds on the side, it'll change the taste of the base dish and the base, the, the whole your balance will go, the feng shui of the plate will go, you can't pick and choose. So most people don't understand feng shui, they, they haven't got a clue what what somebody like Jeff is doing. So, so what it means is if you have somebody like Jeff, you have to give them autonomy and encourage them and then you just um, and support them in their vision. So you have to be able to, to ditch your own um, agenda. Um, and then, you know, and you see, the, the way to work with them is, is, um, is, to, is to have a suggestion that's even better than than what they originally had and then that's legitimate that then then that's like, oh yeah okay that's better but yeah but history is full filled with these conflicts between kind of vogons that are kind of egotistical and don't understand how the world fits together and and geniuses like michelangelo and you know they they the 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 idiots um you know the often the money idiots um, they they think it's all arbitrary and and patchwork. So that like um, a famous example is the agony and the ecstasy. I think was the thing about Michelangelo um, carving the David, and the uh, the Pope who commissioned it, Pope Gregory. Uh, I can't remember Gregory the first or something. But anyway, he came into the studio while you know. Michelangelo was carving the David, and he went, oh, yeah, okay, that's pretty good, but the nose is a bit long. You've got to, like, chop that off a bit. And Michelangelo knew that it was absolutely perfect, and this guy had some prejudice, you know, like against big noses. or <laughs> He had a small nose or whatever the guy's thing was with noses. So, so he was stuck because the patron had ordered him to destroy the, the feng shui of his masterpiece. So the way around it is very instructive. What Michelangelo is supposed to have done is, is said to Pope Gregory, he said, you know what, you're absolutely right. You're a genius. I didn't notice that before, but anyway, impeccable taste. I'll fix it immediately. And apparently Michelangelo picked up a bit of marble, a stray bit of marble and his, his tools, climbed to the top of the scaffold out of sight of Gregory and just chipped away at the uh, marble that he had in his hand, a piece of marble. And then, you know, stepped back and he said, there you are, I've taken it down a couple of inches. It's perfect now, isn't it? And, and Pope Gregory apparently said, yes, yes, that's what it needed. It's perfect. And Michelangelo hadn't even touched it. He didn't lay a tool on it. <laughs> so, so he just tricked them. And now that, that is the, the way, the way to, to do it. So, yeah. Um, but we, in, in general, we're in a, a kind of a dark and a, a kind of um, a dialogue with with the world but there's also a dialogue within the group and so so you also have to play have the play and the teasing and and that to, to make um, to make the, the group work um, it kind of reminds me of the whole the the real art in all of these things is is how to make the the dynamic work and it always always comes down to the same thing uh, so you, the, if, if you have some knowledgeable people without ego, um, then really great things. If you, or if you look at all the great things that happened in, in history, there, there are a few key personalities that just didn't have ego. And that, that's a kind of set an example for the rest. Uh, and if you look at really disastrous things, you know, bands that break up and stuff, they're all these competing egos, and then that that disintegrates very very fast. So, yeah. <laughs> I 
Thanks. Anything yeah. else? On the... I, I don't know. Do you want to change subject a little bit? Or, um, I'm going to get in deep sure, here. Sure. In fact, we haven't got any set agenda. I uh, was hoping to get away with a lightweight discussion, but I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> because uh, never, never works. Never works. I uh, was thinking about the. Um, uh, the you, uh, for some reason, other the a question of catharsis came up uh, during the week, and you reposted your video, which went into all that, and. Uh, <coughs> Um, yeah, I realised uh, listening to that there was a, a, another one of these traps of language. I got to be quite honest. The work catharsis has never done a single thing for me. I just, I just uh, um, didn't get it. And then when I got it, in a certain sense, it seemed like a rather abstract and lofty kind of thing that might occur. It didn't seem like um, an everyday thing. Um, and uh, I, I had a kind of a leap of consciousness realising that um, it it's, it's can be quite ordinary. It, it's just like if you reach a certain point where you're just fed up and pissed off and the whole, everything you look at is just a pile of crap and the world's going to shit. And you say, oh, fuck, I'm through with that, you know. That's your catharsis. Um, but I didn't, uh, it was quite interesting to think of it that way. I never really thought of it that way. Is is like, this is not, I suppose I'd fallen for the trap of thinking all of these things, thinking of things like this as, as uh, lofty spiritual accomplishments instead of something that, that occurs, can occur uh, in your everyday existence. Um, and uh I suppose that it's the the question was well when that happens and you're disconnected and and you you no longer sort of relate to the ordinary world the way you did. Um, it's a question of <clears throat> um, feeling sort of a bit. You, you kind of think well now what you know do, do do you get over it after a day or two and go back to the way you were living, or do you you make an attempt to hold on to this this split you know don't uh, just just see it as a liberation <clears throat> um see it for what it is <clears throat> rather than than sort of believing society's tale that this is an aberration and you've got to go back to taking us seriously again you know um so i, I don't know can you you might want to make a comment at that point so, yeah, catharsis is really the aftershock of trauma. So if you haven't really felt catharsis, you probably haven't really felt trauma. So it's really the, the kind of feeling after a rebirth. So it's, you know, kind of I once was lost and now I'm found um, kind of, uh, and it's, it's kind of a, um, a purgation of the old self and the, the beginning of the new self. So the, for people, particularly doomers, they've come through a long journey of deciding that the system isn't what it's supposed to be. It's kind of the pilgrim's progress and or, you know, Dante's Inferno or the philosopher's journey or it's, all, it's always the, or the hero's journey. It's, it's this long journey that's a personal struggle, a jihad with yourself and all, everything that you've been told. So, you know, the idea that the whole world uh, is progressive and things will get better tomorrow. And uh, Dumas had some doubts about that. And then things build up and up and eventually they come to a conclusion that, you know, this is not going to work. We all fact. All these people are delusional. I'm in one huge mental asylum and all these people are fucking basket cases. And the worst of it is is the people that are most admired are the most broken basket cases. <laughs> so, 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 somebody's firing all these gifts. Um, so yeah, so these bro so you have these broken basket cases, um, and then you suddenly realize what they, you know, you suddenly realize what they are, and then you realize that the emperor has no clothes. At, at that stage, you have a profound breakdown, and 
uh, re it's the death of your old self. It's the death of your illusions. It's the death of your old world. Um, and once you do that, then you can go through stages of reconciliation and catharsis. But it's it's you have to have a traumatic struggle to get there. So like in South Africa, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was designed to be cathartic after you know all the all the troubles and at the end of the trouble so at the end of the struggle um the catharsis is to to purge all of those those out of you so that you can uh, be reborn again begin begin a new life um so yeah it's um it's a rewiring i mean i think if if you're a neurologist i think you could go and look at people's the wiring of their brains and it's it's a rewiring and a lot of it is uh, involves grief, um, so it's grief of death of the of the your old self, your old illusions, and and now the whole world. So it's it's a giant letting go, and that uh, you know it's often induced with uh, plants and and entheogens, things like ayahuasca. They emetics and they they force you to vomit. Now that's deeply psychological as we're as well as physical but the part you see the ancients and Asclepius um, really believed that part of getting over your insanity is is purging it all out you get the demon out so it's a kind of an exorcism and then part of an exorcism is a good old vomit <laughs> but you um it it can be done through ceremonies and things like that. So, so one of the things I'm thinking about um, in terms of secret societies and in terms of grades and initiations and stuff, and why, one of them I think is important. I'm starting to think in terms of um, borrowing from Mithras and, and using the Mithraic um, grades and stuff, the seven grades. Um, but part the, the reason, one of the good reasons for that is Nobody knows what Mithraism was all about. So it comes completely ideologically free. It's basically doesn't have any dogma. Um, that we can guess at some of what some of the things might have involved, but there's no written records. So you kind of have all these these murals, these icons, all these tantalizing hints of what it was about. It it, it really is quite easy to interpret. I think from the Torobolium and stuff, you can see it's related to the night sky and the stars and the killing of the bull. So it fits in very nicely with everything that I've been saying, which you, you take the bull as the alien cortex. So our big enemy is the alien cortex. That's what we're doing war against. And it was traditionally realized that, or represented in the night sky as Taurus. So we are Orion or Perseus or um, Heraklion, the, basically the, 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 the hunter, the headless hunter. And, um, and fighting with his head, uh, represented by the bull. And so since shamanic times, the victory over that bull, the slaughter of that bull, then uh, resulted in really purgation and um, catharsis. And so, so to get there, you can see the kind of things they did, because if you look at some of the murals and Torah volumes, you, you can see Mithras slaying the bull. It's always ritualized in the same way, easy to interpret from the zodiac. But there's um, there's very often a kista with uh, Asclepius's snake in it. And it, as soon as you see uh, Asclepius's staff and snake, you know that it's to do with medicine in the, or the type of medicine that they thought is rebirth. And then, uh, yeah, the snakes always tend to represent rebirth. But th that kista is a uh, is part of the Eloisian mysteries and it's the the kista mystica so kista means um cask we get the word cask from it so it's very symbolic of a casket uh, so uh, you can see it arising again out of things like freemasonry if you look at the initiation ceremony from freemasonry part of it involves being put in a coffin and that that's very, very old tradition. And then that's symbolic of death. And so the, the Kista Mystica is very easy to understand because you can piece together from the murals that you can see what's happening. They make you get in the box. 
um, it goes back to Set and Horus, the battle that they had, and Set tricking Horus into getting into a box, in other words, killing him, putting him in a coffin. But the, you're supposed to get into the Kista, I think, with loads of snakes, which is a um, tremendously unnerving experience. Basically, you, you have to stay damn still in there to, <laughs> to, to sleep with the snakes. But uh, I think then uh, the initiate would be put in that traumatic situation. It's got to be traumatic being put in a basket full of snakes. <laughs> it's, it's a nightmare for me. I'm an African, you don't like snakes. And so, uh, but out of that trauma then, they would emerge from the basket and you can see the actually murals of um, a, of a, a Perseus, Apollo um, and Mithras emerging from a basket um, and with, with the snake. Um, <clears throat> so that, that symbolizes uh, the birth out of the womb, the basket represents the womb and the coffin. And, and so, you know, that's your, your rebirth. And then going through that ritual would be cathartic. It, it's really getting rid of your death anxiety. And the true catharsis is, is getting rid of death anxiety. And so that, that's what it's all about. And you see that repeated over and over and over and over again in different guises. But it's, it's so easy, especially in, in stuff that we're doing, to lean on that stuff. At, at least in ritual, and, and I think I think we should we should get to that. But we'll we'll develop it as it goes. Um, uh, so Lionel, um, you know, Ramsey Dukes, uh, he he says he's totally on board. So he, I asked him if he would uh, spend at least a day with out of the ones in the meeting, so that we can we can go over that esoteric stuff because I think that that's that's one of the, the the missing pieces. You know, that's one of the things where you know where fault is weak on on that side. The idea of personal development, but but I've discussed it with him, and it, it's just a, a blank area. Either basically, is, but I think more and more people realize, you know, like um, Paul King's North and stuff like that, is a, that you need development of the rebel too. You can't just uh, go out in the world and shake it up and do culture jamming and you know transform the whole society and and just have you know all the people stay exactly the same because the society and the system is a reflection of their their own psychology. So it has to be the psychology that that changes. Uh, you can't just sit down on a prayer mat, not in this day and age anyway, um, and just go through psychological uh, transformation too. So you have to do both. You have to act in the world, and then you have to work on yourself. And so those two together make make the whole program. So I think what what I'm thinking the discussing is that you, the whole hog would be really recruitment. And it would all funnel in to, it will be a big game with trailheads, all these various ways of entering into the game. And then there would be um, a threshold, which is an induction into the secret society. So you'd be inducted into something like the Illuminati. Hopefully you're ready, the Illuminati. Then, then part of that, you would be told the real story, what the real story of what we're doing. And it's really a narrative of how we're trying to save the world. And... The, the enemy is the centralized, digital, data-centric, alien cortex-orientated, linear thinking Vogons and their machine that's destroying the planet. And us, team human life, organic, analog, um, the older brain, the, the larger human creativity is we're against the machine and that's so that's the, the the broader narrative and you would be introduced um, to that in a kind of induction ceremony and then you would start you know being a puppet master and getting people into the the game while you carry it on in the next um initiation so in the next, the next degrees in in the rank but yeah i mean seven degrees 
makes such a lot of sense and it was always uh, seven seven grades stuck through lots of things eventually you get to primavera if you look at the primavera painting by botticelli mosito ficino's school and that they had seven grades and so it's it just falls so neatly into that and the seven chakra and stuff so it's you it just it just becomes such an easy narrow and i hope i can convince um you know any artist types that come in on board that that that's the way it should be it's 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 nice to reinvent all these new things like you know and and there's some value to it but i don't think you can get very far developing new things it's a bit like trying to invent invent great food combinations it's like you cannot do it P people have in invented they've discovered all the great food combinations, you know, like cheese and onion or cheese and tomato or something. <laughs> you cannot find oh pickles and sardines or pickles and onion. You can't find things in this. You know, I, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. Chefs, <laughs> you can't find new combinations. So just raid the old ones. It's all about, you know, re... I'll, yeah, I'll let you go just now. I, so it's all about just serving up the old dish in a new style so everybody thinks it's brand new but you cannot serve up a new dish and i hope that i can convince people of that um yeah i uh, i suppose the question there is for people who don't connect well with with mythological um uh, who 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 can't make a transfer can't see the significance of it you know, you, uh, I, you know, I've often read it, not not recently, but a long time ago. Read some of those ancient stories, and that, and the, they don't they don't speak to me. I don't, I don't form a, a, a connection, you know. And I know you probably, um, probably you're going to say something like, "Well, that doesn't matter because it's not speaking to your alien cortex; it's speaking to your more." Deeper levels of your of your brain, which is probably true, um, but the other side of it is that if you don't feel some kind of significance in those stories, you won't stay with them. Uh, you know, you won't you, it, like, for instance, if you're acting this out, um, uh, you pro probably would drop out of it. You know, you wouldn't keep going. So, so. The approach to those stories is important. They're not fairy tales. They actually are codes. So once you start to decrypt these things, you start then to, to get all, um, <clears throat> basically all the connections and you start to get the apophenia. So, so where those stories come alive, is when you say, for example, something like I just did, say like Mithras is actually probably Orion in the night sky. Then you go and research and investigate that theory. As soon as you do that, just you get an explosion of rabbit holes. So once you get the tools, just need a little bit of Sanskrit, a little bit of Greek, you know, and, and basically the internet it has made all of this stuff completely easy is falling off a log but once you start unraveling the scheme you start to see that it's just connected everywhere that everything echoes with everything else and so you you tend to get very excited and you know basically like you're on the trail to to finding the deepest secrets of the universe it 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 tends to be macchio right you you can go too deep in it and and i think a lot of the time a lot a lot of these materials they are our alien cortex. Uh, in one sense, they were written by people that did a code for initiates. So, and they're kind of like route maps to get out of the forest. There is plenty of evidence that just as much of this stuff was written by the dark side to trap people. So the, the, the Bible itself is designed to, to be a quagmire. It's designed to be so impenetrable that if you ever make the pilgrim's journey or the philosopher's journey, it's a tar trap. You, you can spend your whole life on one or two passages. You can do what Jung did and look at the book of Job. And, 
and analyze the book of Job and the ethics of it and the intricacy. And, and basically, you can waste your entire life and you're not getting anywhere. You're just dicking around with the book of Job. And so, so I think that there are just as many, uh, it's, it, well, people, but they're representing the alien cortex. And they, what the alien cortex is doing is doing obfuscation. It's basically squirting ink like a squid. And it's 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 a evasive tactic. So while you're analyzing Job and ethics, and you become a real Pharisee, and you do all this rabbinical stuff, like look at Judaism, the, all these rabbis argue the hell off this, these minor points, and where they're not getting anywhere. They're not they're not religious. They don't have any insight. They're not really developed human beings. They're just fucking annoying pedantic rabbis. And so, so for the pedantic mind, basically for the alien cortex, the alien cortex has set up a trap. And so part of these writings are a trap that's designed to basically just get you in a bramble bush. So it'll take you a lifetime to pick your way out. So they, they delaying tactics for you doing the real operation, which we're about, and that's crushing the ego in the alien cortex. But it's definitely a delaying tactic. So if, if you, You've, you've got to be smart and pick and choose, but think of it like an obstacle course. Is can you break the code and not be uh, distracted by all the chaff? It's it's much more about filtering out information rather than finding information. All all of our science and stuff is based, you know, about getting more and more information. But that's not what intelligence is. Scientists are not really very intelligent, and the scientific method is not very intelligent uh, because. It doesn't have a method for weeding out chafe. So there's no, sci scientists are not generally taught, and maybe they were in previous eras, but increasingly scientists are not taught how to get in a hypothesis, um, do the investigation and gather the data, and then filter out the noise. So, so now, uh, scientists just have one criteria for deciding what, what to do in terms of science, and that's kind of, will it boost my career? So is it is it profitable? Is it a profitable line of research? Will it will it be easily funded? Is there, an, you know, so it becomes a kind of a fashion show. Um, and so, so science is dumbing down tremendously from that. But the art here is to do that, is to, to go through all these things and take the essence out of them um, see which see the traps, see see the ones the signposts, and discriminate between those. And so, so it's it's really a kind of an IQ test. Can you can you? It's kind of like escape the room test. Is can you solve the puzzle puzzle and escape the room before it gets flooded? And that's kind of where we are as a species. Is can you solve the riddle and escape planet Earth before it, it's doomed? Um, what I'm <laughs> thinking about. It, uh, what I had in mind more was uh, people in in Faulty's group who have not probably not been exposed to anything like this before, and um, presenting them with something that is a little bit too um, archaeological. Um, the, the 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 very I, I mean I know what you said about. Uh, you know, you probably can't reinvent any new ideas in in recipe, uh, cooking or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, I was thinking, uh, listening to one of those uh, Michael Mead fables that, um, you know, maybe you need to bring some of those ancient stories into a more modern context so that people feel at least superficially more connected to them, it brings them closer in time. Um, that might sort of overcome the the because the, the, there's a kind of a uh, uh, a kind of an in a way. Well, I don't know. I find it's a kind of an awe of these ancients and their incredible accomplishments because. You know, there's a tendency to you know all these gods doing amazing things and incredible superheroes. Uh, just accomplishing feats that people don't seem to be capable of anymore. Um, and so they, they seem to be presenting something that is beyond what an ordinary person could aspire to. Um, you know, I'm just wondering whether that needs bringing down 
recasting in a more contemporary way and also being presented in a way that that gives uh, a, a more ordinary person some intimation that that could actually be them. You know, that this is not some uh, unreachable thing, you know. Yeah, it's it's that's what I'm, I mean by serving a the old dish and new. So Hollywood does it all the time. If you go and look at the Matrix, it's it's just taken all these hero tropes and just put them in a modern context. And that's what they did with the Latitude Society and the Institute. That I mean, if you look at that Kith figure, that that idol, it, it's it's leaning on so many esoteric traditions from ancient Egypt and, you know, deep psychological things. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just a question of raiding the past and, and updating it. But uh, a knowledgeable scholar of those things should be able to say, oh, yeah, I see what you did there. You just stole <laughs> this and you just used that. And you say, shut the fuck up. These kids think it's all new. <laughs> so it, 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 it comes across as brilliant. Uh, when you read these these archetypes, it seems deep and brilliant and insightful, and um, and there, the reason is that they were developed over a long time. These are these things are like cooking in the sense that you know beef stroganoff didn't just pop out one day. It, it's been developed over a long time. People have made a lot of mistakes and gradually improved it and stuff. And so these stories and these these methods the symbol symbology and stuff has also had a long heritage and so you you take that heritage but just put a new twist on it and and the the thing is to to recombine things to you know cover things up and reveal them in a new way and so uh, yeah it's all all these things that's why you need these artists because they can make things unexpected they can make things playful the art is to is to get something which is fusty and old, and to say like, yeah, but you never saw it this way, and you never realized it could be funny, and you never saw this bit, blah blah blah, and then it's new and exciting and fascinating, um, and it's it's uh, it's like being in love. Yeah, are you you're reminding me of aspect. yeah? It's like, well, it, it's like um, you know, contemporary recasting of of. Uh, opera and um i mean it's been done you know in theater quite a bit um, um i guess um yeah yeah but not not just so keep it in the same genre it's i mean to a lot of extent if you, people like rowan atkinson and blackadder and monty python and all these guys that they were taking the old stuff and rehashing it just completely rehashing it saying it used to be all serious and very starchy and stuffed shit and then we taking it and we're going to lampoon it we're going to take the same things and make them ridiculous and so it's you know it's an art because you can take a sacred icon and and make people laugh at it or something it's like well it's a dangerous game because if you just get it slightly wrong, you've committed a grand sacrilege. But if if you if you do it well, and get away with it, you've actually advanced people's thinking. You've made, you've made them wake up a little bit. But you see, I I put that video out there about the catharsis because it went through a number of things. What I for, I forgot about that video, but but it has a lot in it. And what what it has is is the completeness of those um, Ashlepians. So the, the uh, like at Epidavros, you see, they had theater. You see, at Epidavros is the biggest ancient theater, I think, anywhere. It's bigger than the one in Cartagena. And it's, it's, it's enormous, fabulous theater. And so you're talking about like a football stadium of people watching this play, a Greek tragedy and all this stuff. It's television. Now, it, it, it's not like you go to hospital and, oh, they have the television on because, you know, while you get bored in hospital, you can watch Fox News. But what the, that theater was a purgation. So it was a purgation of the, of the emotions, and they kind of thought of it as an imbalance of the humors and, 
uh, and having you know toxins and miasmas in you and so laughter and tears were considered the way that you get those out so it was exercising demons and stuff and it's it's all legit it's i mean psychology has dumbed down tremendously since those kind of insights and barely rediscovering them so um yes yeah, yeah, that, thinking about that art is uh, uh no you just uh had me thinking about somebody i knew who was uh uh experienced unexplained vomiting and it just went on and on and and uh, there didn't seem to be any medical cause for it. And uh, after a little while, I, I was thinking about it because I noticed that this person had had an enormous amount of bad stuff go on, like, you know, really uh, oppressive and gone bankrupt and lost everything and all the rest of it and been very put upon by other people. And after a while, I thought that the vomiting was actually... Uh, uh, the the system was just trying to get rid of all that, vom vomit up all those rotten experiences, and the whole thing was this, was actually symbolic, you know, uh, that it was this physical, doing physically, what what is uh, I, I mean, which I suppose has got to be done psychologically, but I mean the body was the the, the more basic level was acting it all out, you know, was in a way was leading the way and saying, look, I'm not going to wait for you to get rid of this. I'm just going to throw it up now and get it out, you know. Um, Wait, can, I may, can I add to this, Gary? You said um, basic level. I think, I think we, we've turned things the wrong way. The body is the essential level. The body is never wrong. And then the psychological, the mental, okay, that's, that's just uh, fabrication. But the, the basis of everything is, comes, is physical. And if it's happened, it's because the body wants to, as you say, but it is it is that to take in. That is the way to look at it, to start with what is the body is doing. And the rest, well, we can elaborate if we like, but it's doing something. At this, it's working. It's working its way out. And trust your body. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's an important point because I suppose it's what we tend to do is get it all upside down. You know, so yeah, yeah, it's a good point, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. So yeah, we're given an inordinate because we live in the alien cortex as world. We give an inordinate amount of attention and status to all our little thoughts, and especially in liberal democracy, because if you have nothing uh, bigger than yourself, so if you're a humanist and the most important thing is the individual, then it stands to reason that all the thoughts the in individual has and the feelings the individual has is, is the only thing that matters and so then uh but it's exactly as sophie says it's the important stuff is below all that so you can forget all the stuff on the the surface of your of your thinking process if you if you take nausea for example um the Nausea is often a reaction to poisoning. So what you're, you're, if you have nausea, your body thinks it's been poisoned. Now, the cue that it gets that it's been poisoned is circling thoughts. So, so if, you're, if you have a neurotoxin, you will get um, overstimulated in the brain. You, you will get um, a feeling of, of giddiness, disorientation with racing thoughts and disturbing thoughts and the same stuff you go through ayahuasca what they're doing with ayahuasca is they're poisoning you now the that gives you all these strange hallucinations um, hallucinations and things like that and um, and upsets your balance now what your body your body has evolved to say oh i know what's going on here i've eaten something that's poisoned me and so it, it tries to purge it out and so when you get a psychosomatic illness, you, can, you get that you know, vomit reaction because your body is interpreting all the philosophy and the thoughts going on in people's heads um, as a very basic emergency. And it's, 
it's um, a physiological emergency, basically poison. Those yeah, it's a very so, literal but, thing that, you know, that, that we tend to sort of overthink things, but the, the yeah. body is acting in a very direct, literal way it, it, it's it's just like you know this has got to be gotten rid of and the body knows physical stuff yeah, but not abstract stuff sorry i'll let you go on yeah yeah but the thing is once you realize that imagine what a tool you have what you've just exposed in your toolbox is then then you can get a, a you know, psychology is, for hundred years has been a complete waste of time. It hasn't oh, okay, so yeah, yeah. So, so what, people get so the, the way it should be looked but, at is that you you act this out, uh, and then that that goes uh, that affects your mind. In other words, you you might go through a, a certain ritual process yeah, of purgation, yes. uh, and then uh, that that is that then reflects back into your mind. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Uh, do you yes. think so, you need so to I'll, actually tell so people I'll, that or just you, is it better just that they don't it, know it that? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. All you're telling is the yeah. cortex. That's, that's what I've been... Yeah, no, that, that, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter a damn what you tell them. It's, it's, that's what I was saying about the placebo effect. Is what they discovered is your alien cortex isn't involved in the placebo effect. So you can tell it anything. You can tell it it's a placebo. You can lie, whatever. It's irrelevant. And it's like, oh, shock, horror. But I'm, I'm an individual. I make rational decisions. I have free will. And it's like, horseshit. <laughs> That's just your alien cortex confabulating bullshit. It, it's absolutely scientific. It's just we didn't want to hear it because it didn't fit into our Western dem democratic liberal model, our idolization of the individual. But Gazaniga and Sperry showed conclusively in split brain experiments that, that your, your left brain is just talking bullshit. It just confabulates stories. That's its job virtually is like, come up with a story that puts me in supremacy. And that's what it does. And that's what liberal democracy is. What story puts the alien cortex in supremacy in our society? Well, it's that we're individuals and we have identity and free will and what we think is important and stuff. And it's like, all this is complete drivel doesn't matter a bit but what you see once you realize that and you realize the placebo effect has nothing to do with what you tell people and logos and words and stuff like that well you can go in and say well okay let's talk to the body what happens to the body if you give all of the these signals that some of dramatic events happen what happens if you take it back to the womb there are all these things these hormones and pheromones and smells and stuff and, and your body was cued to see those so you can take somebody through a you know burning through fire experience if you put people in a kister with snakes that's there's a lot more than going on about saying you know oh how does it work your alien cortex works and say you'll, you'll never fathom it out but what they're doing is that they're using smoke and herbs and stuff like that and they 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 worked out through trial and error and a long thousands and thousands of years of experimentation is how to induce those you know how to push those buttons much lower than the, the alien cortex and so you there's benefit to going through some kind of experience like that you know that you you evolved to recognize like being eaten by a lion so so now think think in terms of today where we dumbed down so badly, we've lost all this knowledge. But look at the tools we've got. It, once you know that being mauled by a lion or eaten by a beast or something like, you know, like the Jonah tale, being eaten by a large beast is something which we evolved to be terrified of. And that's very, very useful, especially in terms of rebirth and staging somebody's death, is that you can stage now using stagecraft and virtual reality and 3D and all of these stuff, the fantastic marvelous tools that nobody has the smarts to use you can give people the experience of saying being eaten by a lion now that that is is tremendously powerful tool but at the moment we just use it for disney to make money and stuff like that you know you can go to disneyland and they'll take you on a little experience and it's apropos of nothing you see you see disney himself realized this but he 
after Disney died, it just became a corporation, just an empty shell. Then, then they're just giving people, you know, individuals, Western Democrats, they're just giving you experiences. We're selling you imagineering. And they forgot what that was supposed to do. So now they say, oh, this will be cool. We'll do Pirates of the Caribbean. And you say, why? Tell me the psychology. How do people come out of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride transform? What, are, what have you done? What's the circuits that you changed? What have you done in their body? Well, guys in Disney don't know. They're just some, like, Taiwanese engineers that think, you know, they're told that, you know, if you have characters with appeal and big eyes, it appeals to people's mammalian brain. But they can't do much societal change because it's just like, hey, we give you a little experience and what the fuck it's about. But anyway, pay us money. And now uh, Disney's a big corporation. So capitalism ruined the Ashlepian in, in, a, in a big sense. But, you know, all of that stuff is available to us. It's, it's been democratized. And now you can make videos, you can make movies um, for dirt cheap. It's no longer the preserve of the elites. Now we can make fabulous virtual reality experiences. We can do it on the cheap. But what, what people have lost is the knowledge. So, but we have the knowledge. Now, if we get together all the technicians, it's fucking dynamite. I cannot express to you how far this can go. It's the tool and the knowledge to use it that, that we gradually get in together. Here. So it's big. It's big. I would be seriously upset if it all falls down in a heap. Yeah, I'm just wondering. Uh, um. Because it, it, we are, we have entered into this as a real life experience anyway. I mean, this is, um, in a way, a certain value of, of, of the doom, doom of, uh perspective is um, focusing on on the death of the planet, of the, the ecology, and everything unfolding right here. Um, But I, I don't know what's happening. Are, are people just uh, raising their threshold of, of horror as it's because it's not coming on quickly enough to, to trip them off, you know, um, or uh, um, it's too abstract because they're not getting flooded here, they're getting flooded over there or the hurricanes over there or something like that. Um, uh, I, I'm just trying to... Uh, I'm just wondering whether, whether you uh, know, go on, sorry. Oh, no, no, finish, finish. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I mean, my thought is only half-hatched, but, 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 you know, when you're talking about the, uh, recreating in virtual reality, getting eaten by a lion or something, but, you know, I mean, we've, we've got this, uh, we've, we've got all these horrors unfolding in, on the planet at the moment. Um, uh, there's there's still a disconnect, uh, which seems rather shocking um, that it could be maintained that that we we're not, that this hasn't come close enough to a lot of people and they're not sufficiently shocked yet. Um, uh, you yes, know what I mean? Doom is, yeah, doomers strike me as being stuck. So they they kind of been stuck in the birthing process. So they 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 need a midwife to come in, and they basically need an epidural to get them through the birth. So they kind of got stuck in the birth canal. The 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 all the traumas and stuff on the news they they just really anxiety. They the, the backgrounds. Um, so nobody sees all of this stuff. It's all. You know, wars and rumors of wars. It's distant rumblings that make people feel on edge, so they get eco anxiety and they feel that they 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 can't stick with the prevailing narrative because it it's jarring to see all these things on the news and then to be given this progressive um, this progressive message. So they they the the doomers are depressed and stuck in this hopelessness, uh, but. Most people 
uh, and it's because basically they they're in a double bind they've been given two messages they've been given the message of this is progress engineering humans it's the human story that is uh, and the transhumanist story that human ingenuity can do anything we're on our way to becoming a deity soon people will live forever we'll be uploaded to silicon we'll go on forever and we're going to mars and elon musk is a hero and not a dipshit and then on the other hand it, it conflicts with the message that you're hearing that the arctic is melting you're hearing that this green stuff is just bullshit it's like it's it's just magical thinking of of the worst core and so people can see that it's not measuring up what the ipcc is telling us is happening 70 years in advance. All these scientists that we all relied on and thought were geniuses and stuff are now turning out to have really clay feet and not really understanding their jobs. So, you know, all of this message is, is becoming that people are realizing one by one that, oh shit, this is serious stuff. This, this plane is gonna crash. So they're having the flight 93 moment where they realize, oh my fuck we are going into the ground or a building or this is going to be as bad as it gets. And so, you know, half the people are, no, the blah, 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 we're all off to the stars. And so that, that cognitive dissonance then uh, is the start of the journey. Now, there are very few gurus and shamans and people that can tell them how to go through the rest of the journey. So there, there are very few people that say, you know, out of this cognitive dissonance, this is the way forward. So you can go and join a, a cult like the Christian cult and get a priest, and they'll say, well, the answer is Jesus. And you can do Paul uh, King's North, and you can go and bury your head in, in um, Orthodox religion. But it, you're not out of the woods, because you know that it's bullshit. You know that this Christian thing is a, cu a cultural artifact. You know that, that your imaginary friend in the sky is a creation of man, and man is not a f created from this uh, higher power. You know absolutely that this is bullshit. So you know you're hiding under the covers, and it doesn't really work. But there, there are very few people that say, this is a positive thing. Now, the way through it is your worst nightmare. Nights and psychotic is everyone's everybody feels they're going nuts they all feel like oh, i can't take it anymore i you know, i'm going mad and he's saying like yes you are but it's good it's like the real insanity is carrying on the way you were so that's the 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 rebirth is like you know changing the the world and reorienting it so the, the alien cortex is its primary thing is substitution and an inversion. So it, sure, people feel in, it, it disorientated because they're going through this big flip. So part of the thing about the flipping and stuff is I'm, I'm, I'm riffing on the personal journey as well, just to, putting it into myth in the real world. But the big flip is the big flip from being, you know, saying that you are on the inside. You see, if you're, if you're a liberal, you say, you know, I'm an individual, I have a body, I have an identity, it's all about me, I look at my face in the mirror, I believe I'm my body and stuff. Can and I interrupt you, Mark? Answers with you. Oh, yeah, go well, Yeah, I just, when you talk, well, that, that's an example where I was talking about the ancient mythology earlier um, and saying, you know, I found it difficult stuff to connect with. And here you are saying now that you're, you're, you're flipping hypothesis is a, is a parallel to what has to occur in the individual um no you know i'll just be perfectly honest and say that never occurred to me at all uh and 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 so you sort of developed this if you like parable or mythology thing about story about the flippening um and i, I you know that was my question earlier was if you if you if you're a completely clueless idiot like me and you didn't get that point that that, that this was also a story about the individual uh but, you know is it, <laughs> what's happening to your story when i hear it does it disappear inside of me and do nothing or does it disappear inside of me and start to work away and i don't, don't know about it just, just <laughs> 
Hey, hopefully, if I do my job right, it'll work away under the covers. Because I'm, I'm, I'm drawing drop by drop all these subliminal suggestions. So I'm doing all this auto suggestion, and then that if it. Yeah, the way it should work is that at some stage you put two and two together and go, oh, my God, <laughs> everything you says actually isn't bullshit. It all fits together. And what, you know, so like, oh, I get it now. The metaphor was real and the real was a metaphor and everything like that. So, the, you know, the end of the planet is I like, no, that's the end of your ego. You see, you had the, you had it all, um, completely inverted and I mean it's hard to grasp especially from our our culture how completely inverted it is so what, what I was saying was that the liberal idea is that the answer is within you and I'm I'm here and me and and then you flip that around and you say no the individual doesn't matter the end of it it's I am this universe I'm this whole planet so your, your ego suddenly gets expanded to a point of meaninglessness. But you, you suddenly identify with the outside. Say, yeah, I'm this little body, but I, I just, you know, I'm so, so, okay. When you're a transhumanist, you say, we'll take the human individual and we'll become a god. You say, like, how? The human individual is compartmentalized. How you'd be a god in a box? It it makes no sense. It's a god, but you see, say well, well, say then, but we gave up on the idea that there was a big god outside, and what is that big god? Well, no one really knows, but it's obviously the fucking universe that we came from. Basically, I'm made out of fucking carbon that was manufactured in stars, and you know, basically every one of this, you know, carbon, hydrogen. Um, iron, oxygen, phosphor, and sulfur, and then you know those things came together out of this, out of this universe, to make me. But I don't really exist. All the chinops stuff exists, the nitrogen, and so so you know all those elements of the periodic table they exist, but I don't. It's just I have to come into this body and get eyes and stuff like that, so that all these elements on the periodic table can see themselves and enjoy themselves. But it's the elements on the periodic table. It's the stuff out there. It's the ecosystem. It's the bigger universe that is becoming us to enjoy itself. And you see what the transhumanists have got it exactly upside down. They're saying we are a closed universe in ourselves. And then we materialize that universe as the conquering. We, we envelop the entire universe. We conquer it. We go to the stars. We own the galaxy. It's this upside down narrative. It's like, no, we are the galaxy. We came into this body so we can actually see ourselves. See? So, so it's an amazing thing because the eye cannot really see itself. But the universe can. The universe can create an eye like we've got here and, and look at itself, experience itself, and be conscious of itself. And that's the way it enjoys itself. But you see, Everybody identifies with me in this big world. And the big flippening, the realization is that, no, this is temporary compartmentalized, and it's just some of the rules of the game. The internal rules of the game says, look, you can't have an eye as big as the Milky Way galaxy or Andromeda or something like that, because it, a lens doesn't work on that scale. The, the forces of gravity would collapse it. It's not possible. But it's possible to have an eye on this scale. And so that's the scale it appears. And that's the scale we observe the Milky Way galaxy and Andromeda. But when Andromeda wants to see itself, it makes an eye, this eye. And you look at look back at itself through a telescope. And that's how the universe enjoys itself. But you see how upside down um, liberal democracy is? It's exactly inverted. And it, it, it makes an idol that puts intermediaries in front of the universe well, so saying like yeah. no i'm not even going to let you see the universe now you have to see it through digital interface mm -hmm. you you kept out of it you have to be kept in a city and so it's put, it's substituting these barriers and the reason why our early quarters is substituting these barriers is if you know the truth that it's an imposter matt, matt it's trying to pretend it it is god it's trying to pretend it is the universe 
And when it gets found out, it's gone. It's like, you know, you can step down from your throne now, alien cortex. I've, I've figured out the secret. It's I am part of nature. It's basically, <laughs> this nature observes itself and eats itself and excretes itself. Basically, it, that's the way it, it experiences itself. And I am that. I'm not this fucking voter with a fucking Pierre Cardin. So Louis Vuitton just became the most richest guy I read today. Why? He's selling ego. He's selling lifestyle brands. He's selling basically this mask of identity. He's saying, I can make you the person you want to be. So he's perpetuating the fraud. The richest man in the world has made his money about this narcissistic fraud. So, I mean, how more aperture can you get than saying that if you want to become the richest guy in the world, sell people lies about themselves. And that's the whole liberal democratic yeah. and progressive scheme. So, um, you know, uh, in finding the sort of celestial boundaries that we perceive, we're only actually looking at the, the, the boundary of our mind, I guess. Um, uh, the other thing is, too, I, you know, I mean, just thinking about, you know, the search for uh, life on other planets. And again, where we've got it upside down. I mean, we've already found it, you know. We're just we're just looking out there instead of in here. Everything is so turned around the wrong way. The, the life we're yeah, looking it's... for has just been with us the whole time. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, it's been said so many times that people can't, can't hear. So, again, you've got to, you know, T.S. Eliot. It's, it's what did T.S. Eliot say? The secret is to make the journey and return to the place where we started, but see it for the first time. It's all of that. I mean, it's like you hear it over and over again. It's like, what was going to the moon about? Going to the moon was Apollo 8, the Earthrise picture. Stepping on the moon was a fuck up. If, if we actually got anything out of the Apollo program, we should have stopped at Apollo 8. When Apollo 8 landed, then we should have said, my God, that's why we went to the moon. So we could look back at Earth and take a picture of Earth rise. The fact that we just shelved that, put it in a cubby hole, and then went and tromped around on this fucking piece of ash. And then everybody goes and says, but it was such a great thing going to the moon. No, it wasn't. It was fucking stupid. Neil Armstrong is a stupid cunt. He, he missed Apollo 8. That was what the, the whole thing was. It was discovering Earth. But they missed it like complete doodle twats and went and trumped about on the moon and now forever have to make it into something it's not. They have to grandize going to the moon and say, say well, what did we get out of it? Fuck all. We got Tang and Velcro. It was stupid. It was dumb, fuck stupid. We, we might as well have gone and got out on a fucking coal, you know, on a pile of coal. The moon is a dead fucking dusty rock. There's nothing to the moon. It's a cinder. And then we make this big thing. It's like, we went to the cinder next door. Yeah, and you fucking missed Earthrise on the eight. You forgot that the blue thing is the thing. You know, the reason to have the Apollo program is to see the blue thing for the first time, not to go to the gray thing, you fucking stupid fucking dipshit. Anyway, that's my rant. <laughs> I'm just trying to think some, well, I shouldn't be trying to think some more. Um, but, you know, considering the point of catharsis um, is, uh, um, I don't know. I, I mean, find personally, sometimes uh, I'm still trying to cling to my ordinary life, even though it's just obviously in tatters and it's not worth bothering with anymore. Um, and, and you know, you think, oh, okay, this has only got to get one degree worse, and I'm just not even going to make the effort anymore. In other words, there will be a complete complete break with even trying to take it remotely seriously. And, you know, I uh, think in terms of, you know, um, one more 
you know, a, a shift in the climate or, or more problems, social problems arising out of the virus and all this kind of thing. Um, and there, there's a, you, you can't, I, I don't know, I must be living under the illusion that I'll reach a point where I find a line in the sand and then just say, okay, I'm not going to bother crossing that. I'm just going to give up now. Um, and that's what I'm, what my mind is telling me is the point of catharsis. Uh, but That's I don't think it will happen right. that way. You see the, the, yeah, but I'm, th- I'm, I'm wondering well, whether it will happen that surprising. way. What I'm, what I'm what? thinking is that, that, see, I'm thinking it and, and, and saying, well, I'm positing this line I'm going to get to tomorrow when it gets really bad. Um, but I'm wondering whether the catharsis just won't come that way, that it will just, just be something, there will just be a shift inside and, and you'll just suddenly, you won't even think of it. You, you'll just have a different perspective. Um, you, you won't be saying, oh, fuck it, all right, I just give up. You, you probably won't even say anything. You will give up, but you, there probably won't be any commentary about it. You'll just be I living differently. No, I, I think you would. You see, this is, this is... Oh, no, no. So the kind of enlightenment experience that... I'm really trying to induce in you, is the is total. So it's everything is in agreement. So you see, people in their psychology are all cross purposes. So they have all these modules that are partial and contradictory. And but after this particular realization experience, everything's aligned. It becomes like a huge joke. You laugh and cry. Everything everything suddenly makes sense, and everything's in agreement. So the that point you get to by giving up, totally giving up. So you get driven to a point. It's really Neo's jump in the Matrix, you know, where he just basically throws himself off a cliff. Now, you to get to that throw yourself off a cliff moment, unfortunately, people are not given the training. So they go and throw themselves off a real bridge or a real, tri- you know, a real cliff, or they really bother their brains out. If they're given the training, you get to the point where you're going to jump off the bridge. You say, like, I don't give a fuck anymore. I can't take this machine world, this society, this fucking apocalypse. I want fucking out. And then you uh, you get to the point where you would jump off a bridge, except for you know, you suddenly remember, does it write a number eight, that you're not allowed to jump off the bridge. You're not allowed to do is of any bodily harm. So that that just becomes a tiny little voice in your head that says, okay, well then what I do? You do fuck all. From that point on, you make your pro- you give up on your own problems and make them everybody else's. You see, you see, people get to a point where they go, look, I've got debts, I've got money ways, everything is fucking against me and stuff. And you say like I don't give a shit if I live on the street anymore. I have no ambitions. I don't care whether people think I'm a homeless bum or I just don't give a fuck anymore. And you say, like, okay, so if I owe you money, well, that's your fucking problem. I can't pay. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit about your world, your problems. And so I'm just going to go and sit on a park bench and fuck you. I don't care if I get thrown in prison or a mental institution. It's like I'm not. Oh. See, an odd thing happens. You see, I don't want to speak too much about what happened no, because I, I, otherwise see, part, you part might of go into is, under I false can, pretenses because you want, you want a good outcome. I can see this happening, but um, I think it comes back to this sort of spiritual t- discussion about, and you've said it too, that, that awakening, a lot of people say it, that your awakening is not a gradual it's going to happen all at once. Um, And yet as you're talking there, I see that happening in my life already where, you know, I've become aware of it in the past few months where what you were just saying, for instance, with um, just throwing things back at other people and making it their problem instead of trying to take it on yourself one more time and and manage it and do something with it and just, just completely abandoning the fucking thing and leaving it for them to pick up if they want to waste their fucking time on it, you know. Um, and so I can see all these cracks appearing. But that, that may I, may I when I look at that, 
May I ask you to say, because it brought to my mind that I've been this week in contact with uh, Paul Kingsnorth and I've posted a few of his things on, on Reddit and I, I, it brought me back to get in contact with Mark Boyle. Both of them gave up um, different ways, but Mark went completely off grid and just, just lived by without clocks and phones and electricity. And, and I think he's actually, he's, he's going away that is, uh, that is quite, um, quite exemplary. I really hope that we can talk to him, but I, I've, I've seen in Paul because I've, I've read again what he's written and I've listened to his things. He went to that point, but then, then suddenly he, he turned, he, he made a U turn, um, in a way that he, he's, he's clang, he, he went back to organized religion. And you see, it's, it's, it's a trap too, because I think that suddenly you, you say, Oh, shit. oh yeah, but, but God. And, and I, 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 you know, that is a, a thing I, I got really shocked this week about that. Really shocked. Even though I'd like us to talk to him because he's a brilliant guy. You know? So you, well, maybe we can do him some good by talking about this this point. Um, the point. I think see, that's what Mike is saying about turning back. in a frame it's, in his comments. You see, suddenly, uh, is it is it this what you call alien cortex? But suddenly, you, you it's so it's so huge, it's so beautiful, it's so letting go that suddenly, ah, I have to go back to a frame. I have to I have to get this into an organized thing. Do you know what I mean? But, but was he um, was he going back to religion in that way? I, I don't know anything about this fellow. I'm just wondering a because a few months ago um, he was totally atheist, and a few months ago he joined the yeah. Romanian Orthodox Church in Ireland and just got christened, baptized. Yeah, but I mean, well, the point I'm trying to make is this: is that uh, you, you know uh, when I was growing up and getting religion stuffed into my um and then just left it because you know it didn't mean anything to me and then went on the the more uh, eastern spiritual journey um years later i was able to come back to the religion and see the spiritual things sort of buried in it and twisted up and confused and all the rest of it but you could see the essence of something in there and so in a certain sense, I could return to the religion and see something worthwhile in it. I'm just wondering if he's done it that way, whether he's gone back to the religion in a religious way or whether he's gone back to the religion with a deeper spiritual understanding and he's just um, not not being sort of sucked in by the dogma but actually understands. I, I don't know if you've got any, any uh, impression yeah, yeah, that he's yeah. doing he's that that recently and I, I will send you the, the discussion that he um, I, I he started to consider that uh, that from a very social point of view really uh, considering human psychology and the fact that uh, a lot of our predicaments is is the fact that we have no limits and no discipline and that you needed to get something to a frame and a sort of <coughs> a sort of structure to 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 organize everything and I think it was a very um, Yes, maybe alien cortex type of. I mean, I don't know. We can discuss that with him. Uh, it, it is. I'll send you the the link to his last uh, uh, talk about that. Uh, it was only a few months ago. So, uh, yeah, it, it is not. Um, no, it wasn't. It wasn't that spiritual. What you call spiritual? I don't even know what that means really now at this stage. Uh. Well, well, I just mean that that like you you can you can uh, <clears throat> read. It's kind of like you know religion, uh, a little bit like uh, well, what Hughes said about the Beckley Tepe, where where originally there was probably the shamans, and they were co op Their whole thing was co opted by the priests and turned into a you know um, a big big event kind of thing. Uh, but you know uh, what what the wisdom of the shaman would still have been in there somewhere um you know if it, it would have been recognizable to some to somebody who was familiar with it even though it's been distorted and i, I think that's what i mean by returning to religion in that way that it's just sort of recovering so, what's in it yeah so so this so this is very very serious point i want to get one thing across to you and I'm, i can't repeat this often enough or loud enough is don't turn back. 
you it, see on this journey basically to liberation or enlightenment it's really killing of the ego it's really giving up to the last straw it's utter surrender now people get very close to the brink and turn back so you know, what happens to you if you turn back if you go uh you see what i suspect is happening with somebody like uh paul uh king's north is is that he he gets to the point where he's about to undergo a psychotic break and and dissolve his ego but it's too much for him he's got too much indoctrination he's got a family and so what he does is he turns back at the brink if you do that it's an utter disaster you might as well have fucking shot yourself because uh, it, you become like Lot's wife. You turn into a pillow of salt. See, if you go back to Orthodox religion, if you come close to an epiphany and close to actually defeating your alien cortex, one of its last gambits is to is to actually plead with you, and, and then pe and people um, they don't actually bring down the sword. So the th you get a chance always at the end. Your your alien cortex is is kind of like a psychopath, and it's it's unreformable, it's unredeemable. But in the final moments, when you just understand what it is, when you're just about to slaughter the bull, then then it will come up with something that will stay the sword. So people forgive it. They say, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we won't actually go through with killing the beast. The beast will come back much, much stronger. Yeah. So if you go back to orthodox, um, no, sorry. Nowhere to go and nothing to do after after that. You, you must not turn back. No, let me finish that. So you mustn't turn back to religion. And the, the our the two versions of religion. It's it's psychotherapy is one of them, and the other one is religion. They're both doing the same thing. The religion psychotherapy. They're all fucking religious anyway. They do. It's just a closet re, re, religiosity in psychotherapy. It's paper thin. Underneath they all evangelicals. So if you can write off Western psychology as um, theology. And so it, it is actually just a, a secular cloth over religion. But both of those is, is like getting to the cross and not basically dying on it. So in other words, it's, it's like getting to the cross and your alien cortex convinces you not to kill it all. So you let the demon live. If you do that, you are finished. You cannot then go and restart the passion play. You are fucked. What you do then is become uh, stuck in religion. You you basically will have to, and and you you, it becomes your vehicle for holding things together, for keeping things back, you know, putting things back into an ordered framework. And what you do is all you can do is start recruiting others. You, you start becoming a poison in the fucking society because you, you, you start to get a big square beard and these trappings of authority and you tell the kids about the importance of religion and then you are stoking the lie. You're stoking the alien cortex. That's how religion gets perpetuated by yeah, those guys that almost this. come to the epiphany but turn back. You must not turn back. Uh, you turn into Lot's wife, the yeah, pillar of salt. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's a, a question of the fact that we're, 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 you know, people's entire life conditioning is uh, how to save yourself at various moments of crisis. Um, and in, in this particular point, this is the critical thing not to do. But that you, you, you've actually got to, got, uh, got if, to abandon if you, your... If you do it. You, you, but you, you have sort of literally sold your soul to the devil. So if, if, if you get to the point, like I suspect Paul Kingsnorth has done, is you get to the point where you've actually got all the insight. You know what you have to do, and you have to bring down the axe on the bull, just like Apocalypse Now. You need to slaughter Kurtz, right? That's what all that metaphor is about. Mm. Now, if you blink, if you stand over that bull and look in its eyes, you don't. You can't find the courage to do it. If you can't actually pull that off, you are doomed. And not only doomed, you you become a nexus of cancer that sucks the rest of the society in. Yeah. Yeah. You see, the, the alien cortex 
wants you, it, it's just trying to survive. <clears throat> Think of it like a snake. Think of it exactly like a, uh, like a psychopath. This is, you see, our society in general is going through this process. That we must cut the head off the psychopaths. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, no, let's intervene. We'll be Christians. We'll do the mammalian brain. We'll forgive. Isn't that what truth and reconciliation? No. <laughs> truth and reconciliation is the yeah. festival that comes after the killing of the beast. You can't let the beast off and then fucking have the feast. That catharsis is when you are basically in the Torah volume. You, you are basically, the ceremony would be, the bull would be slaughtered above you. The people would be underneath the grin and pit, and the blood would come down on them. So that, that was the, the crucial ritual before you can get to the next stage, which is the feast. So, so what we the hieros gamos, and the, in, in these alchemical terms, it's the hieros gamos, gamos, and the, the meeting of opposites. So what Paul Kingsworth and those guys have done is they've got to the threshold of of their wedding, and then they've bucked out. They've done it, they've done kind of like you know um, the the graduate movie, where where on the threshold of the the church where they're about to go in and get married, they bulk and run. Then they, they're fugitives forever after that, and and no one will touch them again. No one. They're not going to go through that ceremony. You you cannot do it. It's it. You cannot get back to that threshold once you run away. So so it is absolute. I I mean I, it's. I I feel rather not, like not talking <laughs> to Paul, because because there's nothing you can say to somebody like that. They lost. They, they are a walking tragedy. And I mean, you know, and yeah, you can't yeah, even tell them that. Yeah. They barely understand. That, that's why I was putting the question to the group a little bit, because, I mean, I have uh, messaged him and uh, I'm trying to get him to talk to us with, but I wonder, with Mark, actually, but I wonder, is it worth, worth it? And we might want to think about it between us, because uh the way it's turned I, I honestly i've put the link in the comments of the the video on youtube it starts at 40 minutes when he starts about his his vision of christ and limits and humility and and i started to feel very uncomfortable because he's a guy i was following for years and he was a great writer and he's inspired a lot of people and honestly he's a great guy but on a, i don't know would it bring anything to us to to interact with him at the stage where we are and well you So, so this, it would be useful to, to bring him and talking to him, but don't be surprised if I shock you, because what I generally do to a guy like that is I would eviscerate him, I would humiliate him, I would try and make him angry, I, I would just pour scorn on him, I would I would pour my hatred on him, and and let him feel like an absolute cunt, and that's that's uh, basically it's the only salvation, it's the only way. It's not somebody that, that, that can again. be jerked out of their talk. But I would try and shame him into saying that he's a disgusting individual. What? But I, mean, I would like to do it if you guys want to see it. <laughs> but but basically, he's he, he has given in to the demon. It's it's about as bad as you can get. He's converted the worst sin you could possibly yeah, do. Yeah, that, that's what and I... It's, it's a tragedy for somebody that has yeah, the capacity. I, I felt it's a tragedy, opposite. and I felt that he had turned really to the dark side. Um, and I, I really felt that. I got really shocked. I think I sent you a message about that, and I thought, oh... You know, and he was a great voice of the. But, but I would love the. I would, I would love the. But I would love the opportunity to spit on him. I, I really would. I mean, I I think it would do him good and everybody that saw it. But it might be a bit confusing for people. <laughs> I haven't watched a few of these things. But it might. You, it might not be too late. I, I think he's it, only been baptized for four or five months, so he might be able to wash away the holy water. Yeah. And things you never know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 possible. Maybe I'm being a bit too harsh to say that you can't ever come back. That's maybe a bit wrong of me. But but it, you need a dramatic shock uh, to to actually jerk you out of that. Um, the yeah the the thing the thing about 
that turning back is is that it's it's again that thing that I keep on warning you about is the cop, and at, at some stage, the whole project that that we're doing will this will come out. You see, you see everybody comes into this um, naively. They don't really realize it's uh, they're being suckered into the death of the alien cortex, and so they they come in with all their jolly assumptions and stuff like that. Now what happens is that at some stage, the collective alien cortex and the individual alien cortex, it realizes, oh shit, I've just been suckered into a slaughterhouse. And, and then what, the, what happens at that point is the cop steps in. Now, the cop is a, some kind of archetype. It's, you know, we've discussed it before, but you have an internal cop that says, whoa, 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 no, no, this is getting out of hand. Dudes, this is getting out of control. You see, it happens uh, all the time. It's basically, people will say they will see something and may, they'll get gaslit. See, as, as soon as the alien cortex really sees, oh, I whiff this. This is where I get the chop. It, it will bring a stop to the proceeding. Somebody will say, stop, guys, stop. Now, you, the only way out that is to warn you about it, to say, when... You, when you feel that cop coming in, you've got to have the strength of Job to say, I really want this ride to stop. And you say, A, you don't have a right to stop it for everybody else because anybody can call a halt, right? They, they, you see, the spell is broken as soon as the cop steps into the room and anybody could be that cop. So, so what's bound to happen on this kind of arg and stuff is you will get to some very freaky places. I'm telling you, there's no ways you go into this stuff without having your fondest delusions about how the world is just so and Michael Shermer-like and predictable and rational and stuff. Is that's going to be fucking taken away from you? You're going to be you will see stuff that you will not be able to explain. Your cozy viewpoint about a rational, staid little world that you know, that uh, our progressive narrative tells us is the case, is not the case. There's spooky shit out there. And so somebody's going to go nuts. You're going to see something goes in. Basically, people are going to get gaslit. And somebody's going to go, guys, we've got to stop. And that's a tragedy because you're just getting to the point where you're really about to make a breakthrough. And that's why the alien cortex calls a stop to it, because it knows that there's about to be a breakthrough. The only way you can break the sound barrier and get through this is if everybody knows and they know, like, hang on to your hat. Now at the point where you feel most uncomfortable, you feel most crazy, you feel most out of control, and so and you really want the whole thing to stop, is that that's when you have to steal yourself and say, like, let it go through. Let it go through. Let's, let's see where the fucking thing goes. And if, if you can do that, you can get airborne. But you see, I wonder if I make myself plain here. It's, it's kind of like a whole lot of uh, pilots or something trying to get airborne with this, uh, with this airship. But they're all scared of heights. So you can get them on the, sp you can get them on the plane. You can get them on the airship. Because, uh, you know, la, 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 okay. But they, A, they don't really think it's going to fly. They... You know, they'll entertain the idea of flight, but they, you know, the school teacher told them flight was impossible and stuff like that. So they, they don't really believe it. And, but they can go through the game of flight. When the plane starts to basically take off, they go, there's a point where they go, fuck, this is not a joke. Not only was I wrong, it's basically we're going to find out for real whether flight is possible. Then, then but they also scared shitless of heights. So then they go, I don't want to do this anymore. Stop! It's like so they go from like I don't think flight is possible to no I don't want to know I don't like let me off let me off and you see and you can never get get you will never fly unless you can get over that moment of panic where it's all make or break and what it relies on is just grace there's no formula for this it just has to be a moment of insanity the only way I can see that you um, you can get through this is if you have somebody that's really wise and knowledgeable and then they maybe can distract people or 
<laughs> nobble the cup. Or, but you have to get through this barrier, which is normally represented by, by the cup or the turnaround and stuff. And that's where people will panic just before the ship's about to take off. And, and then they will try and bring it back to ground. So the only way the ship gets off and takes flight is if somebody blinks and something goes wrong at that moment and suddenly, we're flying, dudes, we're flying. You can never get to that flying moment without getting rid of the cop. And that, that implies, personally, it implies a whole society, everything. So, But it, the consequences are extreme. Imagine there is Cute. such a thing as magic. Imagine if we're all wrong and Harry Potter actually works and there's such a thing as magic and we can, uh, you know, wave a magic wand and stop climate change and basically save our species from extinction. Imagine that is the case. Well, it, it's not going to happen if somebody goes like, no, call a stop to this. Magic's not possible. Call it off. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, then we really are dead. <laughs> Um, there's two things. One is... Oh, go on, uh, Gary. Yeah, uh, is uh, two things from that. Um, just briefly, were you uh, talking about being hard? Um, and, and you are, really, you know. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, I guess it's a matter of seeing that that's necessary because if you're not, then people will try and squirm out of the way. So you, you have to take a hard line. Um, you know, if you give if you give people a, a chance to escape sideways no, instead no, of... The, the alien cortex will survive. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, that's what I'm trying to say. The snake, the snake lives. The, the snake is unreformable. Yeah. But people yeah. don't believe it, mm. right? They think, oh, it could transform into something good. Ken Wilbur will come along and say, we'll be transformed into deity and stuff. So they, no, that's the snake talking. So everybody, everybody's doing that with our society. They're saying like, well, civilization, there's some good bits. Couldn't we just keep a bit of yeah, civilization? Yeah. Say, look, it's cancer. You've got to take out the cancer, the whole cancer. Nobody wants to do that. People say, well, we've, you know, but it's, it's civilization's come up with such awesome stuff. You don't want to lose it all. Yes, you do. Every yeah. single bit lasts some of it because it's cancer. And, and they, they're only saying it's the cancer talking. It's the alien cortex saying, yeah, just preserve. Why don't you just keep a little bit of specimen of me in a cupboard somewhere? And you say, oh, what's the harm? You know, who knows the future? It's like, let's put it in. It's like, it lives. You haven't killed the beast. Yeah. Um, the other thing is uh, <clears throat> that uh, it, I think it's important that what you, you've just been saying for the last few minutes is said more to uh, more to people because w what seems to me to be happening is that they don't realise there's another... They're, they're returning to familiar options all the time um, uh, because it's just never really dawned on them that there's another way, which is just to keep marching ahead. You, um, you know, the people come to a crisis and, and retreat from it. Um, or like, you know, for instance, in the case of uh, the, the activism, where they, they only have, uh, they, they only know that conventional action. Uh, they, they don't know, they don't have another option. And uh, you know, you come along and say, "Hey, we can we can do this little game here," and they just they don't get it. It's not part of the repertoire. I've never heard of this before, um, you know. And so it's it's important. For, it's a parallel there, not not just of activism, but this is sort of uh, um, spiritual, personal parallel. Is that people are actually told that, "Hey, when you're in this crisis, just keep going through with it. Just just." Just let it let it rip, you know. Uh, uh, you know, walk off your 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 sort of personal cliff kind of thing. Tell them that that's an option that they can have, uh, because they don't know that option's there. Um, you know, like you did this for me a little while ago, a few meetings ago, and I mentioned to you the epileptic auras that that I was the visual auras that I was getting. And 
you know, for years they would come on and it just makes you feel so gross. You really feel bad that, you know, I would just, just go and lie down and, and, and hope that it went away after a while. And now I've realised that I'm actually looking forward to the next one because the next fucking one, I'm going to stay up, stay moving around. I'm just going to rev this fucker up and let it rip because I want to see what's going to happen. What happens when it's completely taken over my visual field and I can't see a thing, when I'm vomiting with nausea, when, when I never feel so bad because it's probably going to go in that direction, just keep it going. And and see what, see, but you see, this is where you've given me that option. It would never, have, I would never have pushed it that far, you know. And now you're saying, hey, when something like yeah, this happens, let let it go, let let it let it complete its process. Don't retreat from it. Um, and that's probably a very, you yeah. know, that's an important thing to be saying to people. Yeah, let throw caution to the wind. You see it. It really is a kind of a psychological rebirth. So what, what we're doing with the cop is the baby's head is just about to come out of the, the, the uterus and then basically we suck it back in. And it's like, and then it turns into an abortion. And then everybody says, oh, you don't want to go through that birthing process. Look what happened to so-and-so. It turned into an abortion. It's because it wasn't completed. You see, it's the same thing with like Peter Hazen, Stephen, Stephen Hazen and stuff that goes to into a cult and stuff. All of these guys are failures. They all turn back at the brink. Then they all go, they spend the rest of their lives warning you about cults. They're saying like, cults are a rebirthing process. You don't want to go through a psychological rebirthing process. You say, well, how do you know? And he says, because it turned into an abortion. Look at me. <laughs> it's like, yes, you didn't go through to it. Graduate in the system don't say that about their cults. But yeah, since they they since they they didn't go through with childbirth, then they think it's dreadful because they made it dreadful, and they can't admit it. So you can't get a Stephen Hazen and say, "Do you know why cults are bad? Because you made them that way, asshole. You took a perfectly good birthing obst obstetrics kind of process and you fucked it up. Now you're walking around the world telling people, don't go near childbirth, don't have sex. It'll It'll lead to childbirth. That's that's what these guys are doing. So it's it's terribly bad for the world and for them. And oh, damn it! But but yeah, I mean, I think we made the point. But I, okay, so let me make one more point, and then we'll round it off. Unless anybody's got any more questions. But now think of it this way: in terms of apocalypse and basically everybody and doomerism and everybody thinking this is the end of the world and so, and saying like, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but. If it is, then think of this, is if we're all going to die, as all the doomers think, then, uh, you know, then it's, if you go down as a liberal, a progressive, you say, this was all a stinking rotten game. Um, you go down in this miserable attitude saying, this game is rigged. We could never have survived. We're just stupid bastards. And you go down, you know, Sam Mitchell style, all these guys are just basically sour. And saying like, they missed the point. If it is the end of us, then think of this. What makes the human experience 200,000 years of our species? What makes it worthwhile? What do we do in the final moments that says, you know, this was fantastic, rather than saying this was miserable. And the, uh, the thing is the completion of that birthing process. If, as individuals and as a society, in the final moments before the fucking nuclear bombs take us out, if we got to that point of realization, and then that's the meaning of the whole thing. If we can get to the Hyros Gamos, and in, in the, at the restaurant at the end of the universe, we can celebrate this fantastic play and its completion in the rebirth of us. It's, it's almost better that we all do die off, right? See, if, you know, it's, it's nice if we carry on, right? If some people carry on, then we do it again. But it's, I hope you see that it's kind of worthwhile on its own, even if we all go extinct, every last person. I don't think we will. I think some of us will, will pull through. But, but 
you don't know that for sure. It, Earth might turn into Venus in some scenarios. So if we're going to Venus, then, then the thing that makes it wonderful is if we actually reach the goal, the Hieros Gamos, the completion of ourselves. So our completion is not the transhumanist idea that we uploaded to silicon and we live forever. The completion is we complete ourselves and die in glory. So I hope I just sparked a little bit of understanding. Did, did anybody understand what I was saying there? It's, it's, this is the essence of the rightness. Is well. basically you can complete the play. It's a grand finale. Nobody minds that the play ends. It was such a fucking awesome play. It just couldn't be better. It's the Greek thing. Die now. It's like the play is complete. It's perfect. We've got nothing more to do. It's the it's the the end of of the road, and we did it well. Now you can die. You can die happy. <laughs> but but you see what a tragedy is if you fuck that up, right? If you fuck up the story, die miserable. Basically, don't don't get to realization. Then what? It's 200,000 200, years in the making, and it's a mess. You fall flat on your face. Sin means miss, right? Sin comes from the Greek word for miss. So then we're all sinners. If you want to die a sinner, and fuck it up. Bring in the cop at the final moment. Don't execute the Gorgon. Then we don't have the feast and the reconciliation. Fuck up the play if you want to die miserable. If you want us all to die miserable, do a Paul Kingsnorth. Then fuck up the play. Just when we're about to have the birth, deliver ourselves as a species into this higher cognition. Fuck it up. Call it off. Spoil it. Go and do it. Yeah, it's a bit like the uh, two hundred thousand years of making and fuck it up. Just flush it yeah, down the toilet. Like, Make it into a Christ story or something. Just fuck it up. You know. Um, well, I mean, that's what Douglas Adams was saying. You know, that the Earth was just about to produce the answer, and the Vogons came and, you know, got it before it, just before it was about to reach fruition. You know. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that, that's the whole thing is is Douglas Adams, I think I think the gods took him out early because he's fucking ruined the game. He was about to give the whole whole fucking plot away. And I, I you know, I, I think there's a good reason why we have Dickie Dawkins as gay lover and and we lost <laughs> Douglas Adams. Douglas Adams knew too much. He was like, shut the guy up, he's giving too many spoilers away. So I think that's the reason why something tells me he died early. Well, and, yeah. But Dickie Dawkins is still around. Uh, it, I, I I don't, you know, I suppose for people who can read it, uh, it's all there. It's still all there, you know. Um, yeah. But, but, the, but as long, so let's round off just as long as anybody realizes the tragedy of our species is not going extinct. The tragedy of our species is going extinct without reaching the goal. And the goal is realization, right? It's not transhumanism. It's it's empty. It's it's like religion. If you're going back to religion, is what do you do? Just more rituals. Go back to the Orthodox Christian Church. And it's smells and bells and smoke and bullshit every Sunday forever. See? And yeah, alien I cortex wins. I so think I think I'll send. So defeat the alien cortex. And have a, so I'll send. I'll I'll continue on the invitation. Okay. I'll carry on the invitation. Okay, but I, yes, but, I, but I, you I, see, Hugh, Hugh enjoys do, these blood sports. I'll you do know. my best to. to <laughs> yeah, but it, it, something might come out of it because you know he's got other. He's got developed other points on transhumanism and things that are, you know, I mean, we'll see. Um, did you get my message about Darren Allen too? Because he's happy to have a talk with us, but non-recorded. So, um, yeah. because some people might not be on yeah. the yeah. on the yeah, loop, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll try to get as many. I mean, I'll, I where would I? Um, for the moment, uh, we were talking about next Saturday. Next Saturday at half past five. Uh, with Darren, so I, I just wanted to tell it to everyone, and I could put it on 
Reddit because I knew I could put it on Reddit, even though we're not recording it. Okay? Because he doesn't want it to be recorded. Yeah, correct. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for today. Sorry I was late, I fell asleep. Okay. Anybody got anything more? Should we, should we... Uh, uh, so, anything more? Should um, anybody got any more questions? Otherwise, we should yeah. round it off. Okay, so let's just pause, for, especially for, for this one. Take a deep breath. Just center yourself. Know that you're attending. Know that you're conscious. Make no claim on anything that's been said during this session. Give every last bit of it up. Don't take anything away. Be like a mirror. Reflect everything back and give it up. Let's end with a clean slate. No, not in deficit or in credit. And absolutely neutral with the words Om Paramatma Nama Iti. All right. <laughs> Thanks, you. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Everyone. All the best, though. Bye. Take care.